Welcome back to our community. Susie Thomas visiting with Joe Siebert, who is producer, director, everything else, editor of The Sax Man, and uh, a film that you're not going to want to miss. You want to order it now on iTunes, Amazon, get that Amazon Prime account out and order it today. This is one of those remarkable films. It's a remarkable film. It's uplifting. It's sad, but it's so uplifting, Joe. It's... um. I heard stories, I was with your mom a little bit the other night, Mm -hmm. and um, she told me some of the stories that people told at his funeral service, that there was somebody, I mean, it sounded like uh, uh, the uh, Good Samaritan story, where someone was was becoming ill, and here was this man, a street musician, who put the man on a bus, paid for it went with him to the hospital, stayed with him until he was taken care of. One person told that story. Another person needed money, didn't have any, and instead Maurice emptied out his um, saxophone case and gave him everything that he had collected that whole day. This was, this was a man, this was a remarkable man we're talking about, wasn't, it wasn't he? Yeah, well, and I mean, it's a, you know, even bolster that further, we or you know his his closest family. None of us even knew those stories until he passed, and people started making writing comments and telling you know their their testimonies, I guess, of of their experience with him. You know he he would do those things, and he you know wasn't doing it to brag or to show off or you know to get attention for it. He was just doing it out of the kindness of his heart. Because I mean, you can bet we would have you know, put that in the film if we knew about it. But <laughs> yeah. you know, he, he was, didn't tell anyone about it. He did not, but that was just, the, and, you know, when you hear those stories, it doesn't surprise us at all because that really was the kind of, of person he was. He just, he felt connected with, with everybody. Mm-hmm. And I know that, you know, being in a situation where he saw that somebody needed help or, and, and, and nobody else was there to, to take care of them, that he certainly would have. Let's talk about the making of it. How do you approach a man on the street and say, hi, I want to make a film about your life? Yeah, it's kind of uh, an interesting process. You, I mean, we just basically, you know, went up to him and, you know, introduced ourselves and said, you know, we have seen you around, but we don't really know much about your story. And we're thinking that, you know, there might be something fun to tell on film. Would you be interested? And uh, he was really interested, I think, just the idea that he would, you know, be uh, thought of enough to be approached that way, mm-hmm. I think, meant a lot. So once we sat down with him and really just started digging into his story was when it, you know, hit us that there was a lot, a lot there to tell. So, our, you know, our initial idea was to just put a 20-minute short film together, and it turned out to be a close to 90-minute yeah. feature-length documentary. And... I'm sure you didn't realize when you're talking to a street musician, he's the son of a Grammy award-winning saxophone player, right. and musician. Yeah. I mean, this guy had an amazing life, amazing story. And yeah. he really wanted to please his dad, yes? Yeah, his his father played with the Robert Lockwood Jr. All-Stars and was a Grammy award-winning musician as, as a part of that band. Um and his dad was just his idol, so mm-hmm. the reason that he started playing the saxophone to begin with was to, you know, emulate mm-hmm. his dad. It says in the film, you know, his dad was the coolest, and he just <laughs> he just wanted to be cool like his dad. Um, so, you know, they uh, really were a big, uh, you know, big parts of each other's lives. And, yeah. and his father died in the early 2000s, um, but they played together at the Fat Fish Blue and. Wow. had a really close bond all the way up to the end, so that was a, a huge motivating factor for him. Did he ever share with you, Joe, why he did not go out west when his bandmates went out west? Yeah, he did go, um, and, you know, just like all artists, you kind of give your best best crack at it, and, you know, for them, they they definitely rose to some heights and played some big shows and played some big tours, um, but there was just a time when, you know, the the Motown era was kind of subsiding, and it was harder to get work in that, uh, you know, in that that genre. And for him, 
you know, home was Cleveland and his family was here and his support system was here. So uh, for him, it was just once, once it became a matter of, you know, just needing to be around people who were able to support him and, and mm-hmm. just, you know, kind of get your bearings, he, he, re- he returned back to Cleveland. So, and that's where he realized you know, the reason he became a, a street musician was because he was hard up for a uh, bus fare and a friend mm-hmm. of his said, well, hey, you know, throw your uh, case down and see if you can play for it. And I think he got like 50 bucks in 20 minutes or something. And it occurred to him, wow, I can, uh, I, I might, I might come out here and try this again. And that was, I think, 96. And I think he kind of just got a taste for it then and, and never looked back. Very difficult, though, to make 50 bucks every 20 minutes. <laughs> so there would be some yeah, days that would be that harder was, than uh, others. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, and I, that's another, you know, part in the film where he's like, you know, I can go out one night and make a hundred bucks. Sometimes I go out and I don't make anything. And, you know, that's, mm-hmm. that's the thing of it too, is, you know, you go out and, and you're not asking and you're not necessarily being contracted to go play. It's just, you're at the, you know, if it, you may be at the mercy of whether or not the, the Cavs decided to win or not, yeah, and what mood, mood people are in when they walk out of the queue. <laughs> that is so, so true. You know, you're and also so, at the mercy of weather. Uh, one of the scenes that I think just blew me away was how he's still out there and there's no one around. He's in the freezing cold and he's still playing. And and a reminder to us that that means so was a cameraman. Um, want to talk yes. about the the grueling days of filming this? Yeah, it was it, it got it got pretty uh, it got pretty uncomfortable sometimes. But that was. You know, really a peek into you know his every day. He was out there, no matter what the temperature was, uh, no matter what the precipitation looked like. He was he was out there playing, and so we followed him around. And in uh, you know the heat of the summer and blizzards during the winter, and uh, you know he he he, uh, he couldn't he couldn't be stopped. He had his audience, and 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 uh, he he wasn't going to let him down. So. You know, you could you could count on him being out there, like one lady said. He's like the postal service, you know, rain or shine. He's <laughs> he's uh, you can you can depend on him being at his post. And he he was. You could you could depend on him for that. But how about you, Joe Siebert? Could you depend on him every day to show up where he needed to show up for filming? Um, how how did you work together with that? Yeah, so you know, one of his one of his things was. He uh, maybe wasn't the best at uh, keeping a schedule or knowing what was on his <laughs> his agenda. So right. there were there, there was the you know the off time where he's supposed to be at you know Fox Eight for an interview in the morning, and you know we show up at his apartment and he's sleeping, and we have oh. to you know throw a water bottle at him through the window to wake him up. <laughs> uh, and so you know he was, but you know at the same time it was uh, he was kind of a comic relief. <laughs> And, yeah. you know, you can imagine like a Kramer from Seinfeld kind yes. of bumbling out of bed and being like, well, what I must have accidentally hit my internal snooze or something. So, <laughs> you know, he was he was uh, he definitely was entertaining on and off off screen. Oh, that's, my. That's for sure. I remember you saying I remember a story you telling that um, he had hopped on a bus and gone to some other section of Cleveland entirely other than where you were going to be filming and. You just followed the music to track him down. Do you do you remember that one? Yeah, it was the very first day of filming, and oh. it was one of those where where you know he's not answering his phone. Nobody knows where he is, and then our sound guy uh, says he hears he hears a saxophone, so he's pointing his shotgun microphone in the direction that he hears the horn, and we're just trying to follow the follow the maze of of you know where the the sound's taking us and. We grabbed him just before he got on the RTA in Tower City. I was like, hey, are you supposed to be somewhere? And he's like, oh, yeah, I forgot. I was... <laughs> so we had to grab him out of the bowels of Tower City and mm. pull him back out to do filming. So he was, uh, it was definitely, definitely an interesting dynamic of, you know, being, being kind of a older brother almost, so to speak, to uh, this aging street musician yes. but he needed needed somebody to help help herd him around so that was us for a while he was a fashion plate wasn't he 
Oh yeah, he 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 loved to dress, and he was a huge huge fan of just big bright colors and just you know ex- eccentric looks. And yeah, he, his uh, he was he was definitely all about about uh, you know showmanship, and mm-hmm. and he uh, he he made a statement every time he he walked out in whatever outfit. It, I loved what he said. You might not be rich. You just have to look like you're rich. That's right. Yep. You don't have to be. You don't have to. You don't have to have money. You just have to look like it. Look like you have. And I just learned that all those glasses, those really flamboyant glasses, um, he didn't need them, right? Those were just for show. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he mostly they were just sunglasses. He was just wearing, uh, you know, just as a as a statement. You're you, you're just that much cooler. When you're wearing sunglasses, so. but really cool frames, really cool frames oh, on the yeah. sunglasses. Oh yeah, he had uh, his. He said his his trick was the, the coolest frames were ladies' frames. So his trick was he was he would always buy ladies' frames. <laughs> those were the coolest glasses. Oh, that's he, he, so he could funny. he could pull them off. I don't know if everybody could quite no quite like he did. No, uh, he was a presence. Uh, tall. I don't know what his height was. Uh, muscular. He definitely was a presence everywhere he went. Would you say? Oh yeah, yeah. He was. Uh, he was just somebody that, and that initially was you know what brought us to him as a subject was visually our cinematographer noticed him just because of you know that visual presence and thought. You know, at the very least, he'd be an interesting subject just for the screen. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, and then it just turned out that there was a, a story to go along with that. Oh, rich, rich story behind it. Um, what were some of your more poignant moments with him? Because sometimes I, I love the way you just let that camera roll while he mused. Yeah, I mean, he was, you know, he was, he was uh, a lonely person a lot of times, and you know, when we were there and we just left questions open ended and just asked him, you know, how are you feeling or, you know, what's a typical night like for you? He wasn't shy about opening up and, you know, letting us know that, you know, just like everybody who, you know, puts on a face in public, but, you know, behind the scenes, things aren't maybe always as peachy as they, as they look. And mm-hmm. so, you know, he, he did give us a, a glimpse into, you know, what life was like and how things were hard sometimes. And, uh, you know, it was, it was just, it was, it was really an honor just to be allowed into that personal space and to be able to capture those human moments that I think, you know, in the end made the film that much stronger because it it, it just made it that much more human. It's so real. Uh, You got to spend a lot of time together. What would you say he learned from you during that time? And well, I hope you know if he learned anything from me is is that uh, you know my interest was representative of how you know people felt about him collectively. That you know the reason that you know, he popped up on our radar and you know maybe not somebody else downtown was that you know there was something special about him specifically that. Uh, you know, I saw and that our, our team saw artistically um, that, you know, was meaningful that, that you know, we wanted to share with people. And so I, I hope that, you know, through us and just the experience that if he took anything away, it was that he, he really did matter uh, in, in the role that he played in the city and, and to the people around him, um, even if, you know, he didn't always see it or... You know, people didn't always show it that he he mm-hmm. did have an important place. Mm-hmm. What would you say you learned from him? Um, I think I learned from him just being true to what you love to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he just he couldn't live without his saxophone, and that was his passion. And you know, he turned down a lot of things just to you know continue to 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 be with that and. He would do it whether people were paying attention or not. And, you know, it was nice, certainly, when they would. But in the end, he was there because he he just had a, a, a deep connection with, with music and with that instrument. And that's where, you know, I think he was living his fullest. 
And, you know, I, I think that especially, you know, as an artist and you're, when you're trying to make it and you're trying to, you know, get people's attention or you're, 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 you're trying to, you know, achieve new heights, you can lose sight of the fact that you're doing it initially. You know, the, the reason that you start into it is because it's something that you love to do and, and that can get lost sometimes. Mm. And so mm. he was definitely an example of, of just staying pure in terms of, 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 you know, living your passion. Yeah. It's the Sax Man. You can order it now on iTunes, Amazon. Joe Siebert, thank you so much for bringing this remarkable story to our community. Thanks so much, Susie.